Good afternoon, traders. This is Christian from Hertz Tribeca Trade Group, and today is Tuesday, September 27th. Uh, risk is slimmer in front of you guys. Everything that we're going through is for information purposes, only not giving out any advice or recommendations. So listen, I wanted to do something different in today's video. I got a lot of questions we were going over today, you know, this, um, you know, what we're experiencing in the, in the market right now, which is a very fast move and um and interest rates and you know what the implications of that and what the trade is right i mean how do you take advantage of of yields going up like this right what's the best thing uh what is the best thing to do so so for example if you bring up us bonds right now right so we're going to bring up us bonds right and we're going to look at the yields right so this is two years so again there's different uh the the government issues these right every day we get different uh almost it feels like every day we get bond auctions right so the the yield right now you know the going yield right now for two year what's called notes you know so two years you buy it you buy a bond for basically two years and they give you this yield right every year you get 4.2 percent right and um notice of course you know because i'm always quoting what bond futures are doing we're going to talk about that too but I mean, the, this is pretty good yield right now versus what you versus, you know, a couple months ago, a year ago. Right. So on and so forth. And if you go further out. Right. And if you if you want to lock in a 20 year bond. Now, again, if you buy this from the government or if you buy this through your broker, right, you're you know, you're going to have to hold this for 20 years. If not, you know, you can sell it in the secondary market, um, but you're going to be subject to price risk, right? But you know that you could, if you buy this through the government, right, you have the full faith and credit. Uh, that's why we call it almost, almost risk-free. The only, uh, the, you know, there is some small chance that the, that the government does go under, but it's obviously a small chance. And that's why people say that these are virtually risk-free. That's your only, that's your only risk if you're holding to maturity, right? Is that, um, you know, that the government doesn't pay you back, right? So you give them, I don't know how much it costs for, for T-bonds, but it, let's say just a normal CD or a normal bond, it costs you a thousand dollars, right? And then you get 4.1% every year. So you get $41, right? Or, you know, if you decide to do the two year, you get, uh, you know, a little bit higher rate than right now because the we have a we have a yield curve inversion so the shorter term interest rates are paying you more so this is very different right and I'll, i'm going to go into equities too in just a minute but i thought i would start with this and we can kind of go into this i talked about this in the tgg midday um midday session and and try to answer as many questions but go out to five years Right. So this is what the yield has been doing. So so you can see how drastic this is. Just last year, you couldn't get anything on this. Right. So bonds weren't paying you anything. Right. And that's why nobody was has really been talking about this. You could get 25 basis points. Now, all of a sudden, you can get 4.3 percent on on a two year bond. So that's significant. That's a big change. And that's also why this market is partly freaking out a lot, right? Because um, it's a major shift when people see that they can get 4% uh, guaranteed by the government uh, for a couple of years. Well, they're going to take their money out of some areas. It could be equities. It could be something else. And they're going to say, hey, I'm getting 4% for basically, you know, just give, you know, just having a bond where a year ago it was 25 basis points. All right. So that's why, this is getting a lot of attention because, you know, what we try to cover a lot of times, you know, even though um, you may need a cup of coffee for this video because bonds are not exactly uh, the world's sexiest things in the, in, in, in the world, but um, this is a notable change. And if you go back and if we look at this over time, you know, really pretty far, you know, the last time that we were yielding up here was going back to 2005. I mean, that's a long time ago. So if many of you just started trading in the last couple of years, you hadn't, you haven't really dealt with this before. I started my trading career right in here, right? So I, um, you know, dealt with the dot-com bubble. Um, I remember yields, with, you could see was 6.3%. You could go places and people, you know, your savings account, this is when they actually, your banks would adjust the rate. Now, no banks are adjusting the rate um, to this right now. It's a different world that we live in. But you could go and you could buy um, treasury bonds. 
or you could park your money in a savings rate that would get you, you know, maybe not 6%, but, but maybe it was giving you like three or 4%, right? And then the last time we had this too was in here, right? So I've been through this, I've been through a couple of these cycles. Again, um, you know, history rhymes like this because we haven't, you know, there's been no talk uh, over the last few years about buying bonds because there is no reason to do so. There is no yield, right? There's no demand to do so when, when you're not getting anything for your money. All right, so let me come back to this and because I've got a couple things to kind of talk about. A lot of people are asking me, well, I don't know how, like, where do you buy bonds? You know, where do you do this? So first of all, the market this, this today, right? We did finish, um, you know, once again, right now rallies are getting sold, right? That is very uh, characteristic of a bear market when rallies get sold, like the same thing happened yesterday. We tried to rally a little bit and turned around. So I would, I will remind you that we are now in the middle of the Jewish holiday, which is in addition to September being a very seasonally weak period of the year. Uh, this Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, that's typically, you know, they say sell uh, Rosh Hashanah and buy Yom Kippur. So we're getting close to that. We've got three more days of September and then that's it for the month. We're out of this month um, and we're out of the worst seasonality of the year, especially in a midterm election. You've heard me say this over and over, right? And on Friday, uh, coincidentally, we also get a gauge of inflation. We get the PCE deflator. So I, you know, could that be a pivotal point? It could be, right? If we finally see inflation come down. All right. So um, the other thing that I thought was interesting, you know, even though for the most part, you know, we've got a lot of issues going on besides the conversation and bonds that I'm going to get to. But um, UUP was up again today. So um, it uh, it actually was flat. Sorry, I saw it up earlier. But, um, you know, these are driving some big moves right now and big volatility in the equity market. Speaking of volatility, right, um, the VIX did not really come in at all today, so it's staying elevated, right? So we're right around, we're very close to 33 at this point, and we're now back to, almost back to levels that we saw back in June in terms of the volatility, all right? And if you notice too, um, you know, so what under, what uh, outperformed and what underperformed for the day? Right. Uh, well, interesting that biotech actually outperformed metals and mining, which is a very interesting pair. Um, I don't have any correlation between those two, but they both finished up about 2.8% for the day. Um, biotech, we could look, you know, I think you kind of have to sift through individual names. I still don't, I don't like this chart, right? You had a lower high, lower high, and then a breakdown here. And I don't know, maybe it could back and fill it, but it may put in another lower high in here too. So, um, you know, I think that it's still a very troubled area right now. All right. So that's that was the best performer. And then if you look to see what the areas that really underperformed today, they were things like now the pot stocks were down on the low of the day. That's just, you know, has been pretty consistent. Uh, but you had the utilities, the REITs, the consumer staples. What what do you have? What are those? What's in common with those three areas? Well, it's they all can give you they can they all give you high higher dividends than the stock market than the overall market. So notice these things are starting to break down, right? Now people have tried to anticipate this for a while, saying as interest rates were going up, well, you you finally now have a breakdown somewhat in in utilities, right? I mean, this was about a fifteen percent move. We're looking at about, about eleven or twelve percent move at this point. So interesting that these swings are have kind of corresponded together, the one that we saw in June and then the one that we saw now, even though we're not down quite as much, this was again fifteen percent, and this is about twelve percent. Um, I actually measured it out a little bit, but uh, that's what uh, that's what Bloomberg told me. Um, so but why is this happening? Right. Why is there a, there a, you know, sell out of these areas? Well, part of the trade with now there's there's many different things, but one of but one of the um, one of one of the reasons I believe is because people go into these things for yield. Right. And I just talked about how, you know, bonds, uh, treasury bonds, which uh, let's see, what did I did I take away this screen? Oh, yeah, I must have. Right. So. Yeah, so I just went over. You don't now. You don't need bond substitutes, right? You can get that yield right now in uh, by the by the risk-free bonds, right? So again, 
here's the rates and here um, XL or IYR, which I brought up in here too, uh, which I don't know where it went to, but let's, that's fine. We'll see what IYR, IYR is currently yielding. So this is the REIT ETF, all right? So this thing is yielding. It was giving you something. Now, again, remember just a year ago, you couldn't get any yield at all. At all, We just looked at two-year treasuries and the rate was close to zero. Well, now you could get 4.3%. And if you were just in REITs for that particular reason, uh, you probably want to get out of REITs and maybe lock in some rate on your bonds. And again, I'm, I'm just speaking hypothetically. I'm not giving out any advice or recommendations, but instead of being in, in an equity, Right, you could get that risk-free rate in bonds, right? Because you do have a whole set of other risks being in the equity, right? So this is yielding. So you could see the yield right, right in here. Okay, so that's one particular thing that's that's interesting that that's going on. Um, I brought up a couple notes to kind of talk about this because um, people ask me. Number one, they're like, "Well, well, I don't know. Like, how can you go and buy these bonds?" Well, you could do a couple different things, right? You could go to Treasury Direct. Right, and I have an account open with uh, with Treasury Direct, right? And you could buy. You do have to set up an account with them, and you have to fund the account. Um, it's it's cumbersome. It takes a while. To, it's with the government, so bear that in mind. But you can, you know, I purchased a, a few months ago. They have uh, inflation uh, protected bonds, right? So and they were yielding pretty decently. But you could also go through them. Now, again, you're going to have to get used to this. Like there's bond, there's the bond auction. So you give them money first and you tell them that you want to buy. And when there's a next auction, then they will allocate you on that. That's basically how it works. If you don't want to go through this process, right? The other thing that I suggested to people is, you know, you could call, you, you could call your financial advisor up. Right. I know people have gotten used to doing these things on their own. It's not Robin Hood, guys. You know, unfortunately, you want someone to actually hold your hand a little bit through the process if you've never bought bonds before, right? To understand like if you need to sell them, you know, how it works and so on and so forth. Now, you could also, if you don't have a financial advisor, if you have if you have an account at Fidelity, like I have an account at Fidelity, and every once in a while someone calls me from there and asks me if I need any help, right? So they have financial advisors. And I think it's kind of the same thing at Schwab. Um, I believe anyway, I don't have an account at Schwab, but I do at Fidelity and call them up. They will help, they will walk you through, you know deciding how to purchase things. But I will tell you, and again, I, I've, I started off my career as a financial advisor way back years ago uh, before I started trading uh, institutionally. So I've got a little bit of that background, but it's not what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. So don't, I'm not a bond expert. Don't take what I say uh, for a hundred percent certainty because I don't, I'm not buying bonds every day. Um, I'm, I'm not trading bonds every day. Right. So let's um, talk a little bit about this. One of the things that I think that you need to think about, and it's the same thing. We're going to talk about equity yield too, because I see a lot of traders looking at, you know, a particular like, Oh, look at Verizon and look at what it's yielding right now. Right. Let's talk about that. The same thing too. Keep in mind, it's the future of, of rate. Of it's the future. You have to think about the future path of rates. For example, like so, someone asked me today. They're like, "Well, do you think I should go ahead and buy, you know, a ten-year bond?" Well, it really depends. So, number one, you're going to have to lock up your money for ten years. Um, you could get your money out, but there may either be a penalty or the price may be different. So, why will the price be different? Right. So, first of all, let's. I always like to start with the easiest, like, the easiest scenario. You hold for, let's say you decide to do $10,000 for whatever bond, okay, right? And it's, uh, five, let's say, 5% for, for easy math, right? So let's say that you hold that and you're going to get your money back, um, $10,000, or if you do a $100,000 bond, right? You get your principal back at the end of the 10 years, and meanwhile, you, um, you get interest payments, right, that are equil equivalent to 5% a year. That's basically easy enough, right? you locked in your rate and so on and so forth. Now you have to be kind of comfortable with that, right? Because what could happen, of course, as fast as interest rates are moving, I'll go back to my chart right now, right? We don't know. I mean, you, you can't say like, 
okay, this is as high as it's going to get. <laughs> you know, and the way that it's moved, just a couple of weeks ago, it was at 3.6%. Now it's at 4.2%. 4 so who's to say that it can't go to 5% in a couple of weeks too? Again, you have to think about whether or not that's likely or not, right? Or how, how what the probability is. But we know that interest rates are moving very fast right now. So you don't want to, so one of the things that you want to think about is, well, are you going to be sad if you go ahead and lock into a 10-year bond at, you know, 4.2% and in a couple of weeks, it's at 5%, right? What, what the prevailing rate is, because what will happen is that brings down the value of your bond. So if you need to get out of it in a year, right now, the, the price of your bond is going to be lower because the prevail, the current rate has gone up. Okay. So again, you don't have to worry about that unless you need to get out of the bond early. Okay, but um, we're going to cover that with equities in just a second. But the thing, but you also you don't want to have like that that buyer's you know buyer's remorse saying, oh geez, I should have waited a couple of weeks, right? So you could do things like scale in. You could you could do a ladder portfolio, which I'm not going to explain a ladder portfolio because the video would be an hour. But you could stagger your purchases across maturities, right? So if you do like, for example, so a ladder portfolio is you buy like a one-year bond, a two-year bond, a three, and a five. So as the one year comes up, you push that back out to five years, right? As the next bond comes up, you push that out to five years. So this way you're, you're getting the benefit of what interest rates, they may be benefiting for you, they may not be, but you're reducing some of that um, interest rate risk as it changes, okay? But think about the future past. This may be fine for, for you. Just like, um, I, you know, I was kind of thinking that this in terms of mortgages, right? Many of you have mortgages, right? And what happens is, uh, you know, if you have bought a mortgage and the interest rate was, say, 5%, and what we saw over the last few, certainly not today, but what we saw over the last few years is interest rates went down, right? You can refinance that mortgage, right? And many people did that, and they got lower interest rates. Maybe they locked in 3%, 3.5% or 4%, right? So it's tough to know when you're going to get the absolute low, but... You can't like it's expensive to refinance. You have to go through closing costs and so forth. So it's not something that you can change your mind with every month. So think about it's kind of the, th the same way that you should think about when you're buying a bond. Now, you don't have to go through closing costs when you buy a, a bond, but you're going to have you're going to be subject to the prevailing price. OK, so I think we covered that one. Yeah. And think about like what's the acceptable deal to you? Right. Um, maybe that's 4%. Maybe that's 5%. Because again, you're tying up your money for a little bit, right? Depending on what maturity, right? And you, you theoretically don't want to be pulling the money out because you may be getting a penalty. So you have to think about whether or not that's acceptable you, to you to tie that money up, right? And again, it's, you're getting a rate that's much different than it was a year ago, even a couple months, a couple weeks ago. Um, all right, so what's the difference between a bond and a bond fund? So this is <laughs> this is where it gets kind of interesting, right? So people look at these things, and I'm going to go a little bit off the rails here a little bit, but the difference between a bond is you you own that piece of paper, and as long as you hold it to the maturity, it's not going to fluctuate. You're still going to going back to the, either if you bought bought it for ten bought a bond for ten thousand dollars or $100,000, no matter what, you're going to get your money back if you're doing this with the government, okay? As long as you believe that the government is still going to be around. No, please, no conspiracy theories. But um, you're going to get your money back. If you do this with a bond, a bond fund, and you could look at any of them, you know, there's a million of these things out there other than the ETFs, right? So you could look at TLT, for example. Now, this has a portfolio of, it says, plus 20-year bonds, right? And you could see right now, it's not yielding that much. Um, for some reason, it's only yielding 2.8%. But this is going to float around because this isn't a fixed bond that you're buying. You're buying a marketable security, and it's going to fluctuate based real time based on what interest rates are doing right and that's what we look at every day to tell us you know what the movement in the in interest rates are doing on the long end of the curve but you're subject to to all you're subject to market risk right it's going to move around um so this may this today it's 2.8 percent okay but if tlt goes down another dollar Right. Yes, the yield's going to go up, but your investment. So let's say you put ten thousand dollars into TLT, right, and it goes down a dollar. 
right? So you, you, you're going to lose based on that, right? Um, because it's not a fixed face amount of a bond. So very different between what, what bond funds are doing and what an actual bond is doing, right? With a bond fund, it's going to fluctuate based on how interest rates, uh, the future path of interest rates, okay? So, you know, let's look at bond. You know, obviously we've been looking, we look at this in every one of our videos, but we know that, so if you owned, if you bought, for example, TLT just a month ago, Right, it was in the be or the beginning of the month, and you paid one twelve, and you're like, well, hey, this is supposed to be a bond ETF. It's supposed to be safe. Well, no, it actually went down twelve percent in a month, right? So much you're losing much more in the price than you were actually going to receive in the yield. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about in terms of your price risk, right? Somebody said so. We were talking about this today, and somebody was like, well, I can go into this because it's a lot safer. Do you think down 12% in a month is safe? I don't. So there's a lot of misconceptions about these types of things. Okay. You when you're not locking in um, and owning an actual bond, you, you're subject to the to the market rate. Now, again, this is a very big fluctuation in a month, but still you're thinking, hey, I'm going to go in this and I'm going to I'm going to earn 2% yield. Well, you just lost 12%. So okay, great. You get back the coupon but you still lost 10, 10%, okay? So it's very important to kind of to, to think, to, to map this out and to understand this, right? Um, that you have price risk just like you do with purchasing anything else. Um, they can, you could actually lose money faster in these bond funds than you can in equities, right? Depending on, you know, what's going on in the world and, um, you know, the, the volatility. OK, so I, I get so I wanted to. So this is a little bit off the rails a little bit in terms of this. But people I get this all the time. I see this all the time on Twitter. Oh, my God, this is this is a bad sign for the market. HYG is going down. Well, what you know, so first of all, what is HYG? Well, they're corporate bonds, right? They're another way of, of packaging bonds. They're different than treasuries, right? These are corporate bonds and they're there are corporate bonds from a little bit riskier. Um, areas of the market, right? And that's why they're able to generate the higher yield because you're dealing with companies that are not exactly on the up and up, right? They're, they're not the, the best credit worthy companies out there. So when you purchase this, right? And again, I think this is funny a little bit because people should really know what they're dealing with. So risks of corporate bonds. Now there's credit risk, right? And what's so what's credit risk? Credit risk is is just that, right? I talked about the credit credit worthiness of a company, right? Companies have to be going concerns. If a company declares bankrupt, right, then you could lose your you could lose your money, right, by investing a bond, right? You could even equity or bond, right? Now equity now bonds have, are higher up on the totem pole, on um, that you you might have a chance to get your money back uh, versus not so much in equities. But um, but that's the credit risk, and you hear you think credit bonds, or you know you think um, you know it's it, it is like credit risk, of course, right? That's with any bond, but it's more so with high yield bonds. Now, what about this one? Interest rate risk, right? So people look at this and they're like, you know, they look at HYG and for some reason they think it's an, they think it's an equity. Now there is a little bit of an equity. It's more of an equity than it is, uh, than treasury bonds are because you're dealing with, um, higher yield companies, right? So, so for example, if you want to look at the basket of HYG and the companies that are in here, right, just to kind of give you a sense, right, but you're dealing with BlackRock. I uh, no, no, that's, that's not right. You're dealing with Transdime, Direct TV, Centene, Caesars, Sprint, right? These are different. It's not Apple. It's not, um, you know, it's not Google bonds or, it, you know, these are, it's Carvana <laughs> has bonds in here, right? So it's riskier. So yes, there is a bit of an equity component to, the, to this, but a lot of this move that you're seeing here is explained by the interest rate move. Right. And again, it gets lost on Twitter because for some reason people think that this is an equity. It's not an equity, guys. Right. And if you map this out um, and if you put together, oh, I, I don't have this chart in here anymore. Um, I think I did put this on Twitter. So that might be a little bit faster than um, 
than me bringing this up. But look at, so if you overlay this with a treasury bond, right, it's the same path, right? It's when interest rates are moving like they're doing and they're moving higher, right? That means they're pri the, the price of your bond is going to go down, right? It's an inverse relationship. So it's doing nothing more than what, um, now they're, they're, it's doing nothing more than what treasuries are doing, okay? So number one, it's not an equity, guys. It's a bond. Right. And if you look at what the duration, you know, it's important to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples, oranges to oranges. So what you do is, you know, when you're comparing um, some corporate bonds to treasuries, you want to make sure that you have the same duration, right, around the same average uh, maturities. Right, right. You don't want to be comparing five year bonds to 20 year bonds. Right. So if you look at the duration in here in HYG, it's about 4.5. Right. The the ETF that mirrors this is if you go to IEI, right, you could see that the maturity is about so the duration is roughly the same, 4.5. Okay. So that matches, and that's why we use IEI. Okay. So look at so you know. It's the same kind of concept, right? Um, now, again, it's still bad. They're both going down, but it's it has nothing to do with equities. Um, well, sorry, I shouldn't say it has nothing. There's a component of equity risk, but, um, you know, and that's that's market risk and price risk, right? But again, uh, where's my where's my little, but you have interest rate risk. It's a bond. <laughs> so again, you're not used to seeing this in, H, in HYG, Right, the price go down like this because you're not used to seeing bonds go down like this either. Right, this thing has gone from 128 down to 113. Now, of course, if you want to look at these um, together, what you do, and this is why I talk about credit spreads. This is where you analyze if something is going, you know, and the and the Fed looks at this because they want to know if what's called if spreads are basically blowing out or not. Right, meaning. Here's I, I, e, I, and H, Y, G, right? Notice how they're, how, and we can kind of look at this um, over five years. And, and again, I look at, I bring this chart up many, many times, but I understand maybe not everybody knows what it means, right? But you're looking at one over the other, right? Notice what happened in 2020. Why did this happen, right? Because everybody wanted to jump in to the most safest thing out there, which is treasury bonds, Right. And treasury bonds went nuts to the upside. So we could look at this in terms of IEI here. Um, is this 2020? Yeah. So here's what happened. Right. This was ripping when the pandemic was going on. It was a flight to safety. People were going nuts going into um, bonds. They're like, hey, get me into get me into something super safe. Right. And this thing jumped from 125 to 133. You don't normally see that happen, right? And HYG was not doing the same thing because that is riskier. So spreads really widened out majorly all the way to 2.1. We also saw this in the back end of 2018, right? This, I believe that was when we talked about trade tariffs and, and there was tra a trade war going on, right? Spreads blew out there. There was a lot of risk. Now you don't see this right now. They're both now again, they're kind of going together. They're both going down, but the spread between one another, right? We're not seeing that credit risk right now. We are seeing interest rate risk, but you're not seeing credit risk, right? And that's the beauty of putting these together is to isolate the credit risk. Okay. So what's driving down the price? What's driving down the price again is interest rates. Right in HYG, and you could look at the same thing going on in LQD as well. It's not that the companies are doing bad; it's that they're they're going to move based on the prevailing interest rates, which are you always look at, always have to look to see what treasuries are doing. All right, I think I nailed that point home. But again, these are questions that I answer all the that uh, questions that I get a lot of the time. Um, I also saw, see people like looking at these charts, and they're not they're not really grasping what's going on. All right. What about equity yield? Okay. So now people are looking and I'll give you an example. All right. So let's look at Verizon, right? Because why am I bringing up Verizon? Well, Verizon is, is typically a high yielding equity. Uh, oops, sorry. I must've flipped out of this Verizon DVD. 
All right, bam, look at this. 6.7% right now. The, the um, indicated yield right now is 6.7 in Verizon. Now, does that mean that you're going to get, you're going to earn 6.7 no matter what? No, it does not. Why? Because you're, it's not a bond, right? You're not buying something and five years later or 10 years later, they're going to redeem it to you at your fate, at your thousand. So again, take the example of $10,000. You put $10,000 into Verizon you put, or you put $10,000 into a treasury bond. Well, you're, the $10,000 you're going to get back from the treasury. Again, as long as the government doesn't go under, you will get your $10,000 back and you will get those interest rate payments. You put $10,000 into Verizon, Verizon is all over the place right now. You, you know, who knows what you're going to get tomorrow in Verizon. So this could be kind of a little bit of an illusion that you think that you're going to just get put $10,000 and a year later, you're going to get, uh, you're, you're going to get the $10,000 plus 6%, which is what, uh, a, a a thousand sixty dollars, right? Um, or or ten thousand six hundred dollars, right? And by the way, they are reporting their their dividend, so they're going to give you sixty five cents. Now, again, they put out their their. Um, I guess they put this this out quarterly. So again, you don't get one payment a year; you get four payments, right? Which will add up to the to the to this particular yield as long as the price stays the same. So again, what what am I getting at? That the what's the risk here? is that Verizon that the price is not stable. Now it could work out for you too and price could go up. But look at look at the path of what Verizon has been doing. Right? So let's say you bought this a month ago and you said, "Hey, I'm going to get my yields, right? I, I bought this for, you know, I I've decided that I'm going to like get this yield with the with the dividend." Right? And you're like, "Okay, I bought this at 47 and now the stock's at 38. What is that? Down 15, 20%?" So you're thinking that you're going to earn this yield right of whatever it is, 6.7% and the stock goes down 20%. <laughs> so the whole reason why you were you went into this stock thinking that you're going to oh, I'm going to earn this high dividend well, the stock falls 20%. So you lost big time, you know, so you take the net of the price and the dividend and you could see that you have a big loss on your hands. Okay, so stocks are not, again, you need to stock to stabilize. And if it goes up, you know, and that's the beauty of equities is that you make it the price appreciation, right? We're going over bad situations here because I, I always wanna talk about what could ha what the negative could happen. Now, if you believe that stocks are going to rebound, and this is uh, enough of a move for you. You could buy this, it's currently yielding 6.8%. But if the stock actually goes up, you know, you might actually make, make some more money on the appreciation of the stock. But just to put things in perspective, if you had that view a month, a month prior, you would be you would be very sad at this point, um, trying to think that you were going to earn that dividend. And meanwhile, you're the stock lost that much money. Okay, so again, just putting this in perspective, why am I putting this in perspective? Because I'm getting a lot of questions of people like, hey, I'm going to jump into the stock and earn this, this yield, right? Well, again, what if the stock falls another 15, 20%, <laughs> then you're, you're not going to be happy, all right? So you can't fix the yield, uh, my point is, and in, in an equity, right? Now, maybe you could do it by, you could, you could sell, you could buy some puts, too, if you could buy a put for one percent, right? Then you then you're you're keeping your your stock around the price that you bought it, and now you just have to subtract the price of the put from the dividend. Now that's a little bit more sophisticated, and that's more outside of this, you know, particular video. But um, that's what happens when the price goes down. All right, guys. So that's the main thing. And um, yeah, I mean, you're gonna like. I see the cringe. I told a couple of people today. On Twitter, they're like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to purchase these bonds. Pick up the phone and talk to. I, I know, like a lot of new, newer, younger investors, and I'm not trying to be mean, but they don't like to, they, they don't like to talk to people sometimes. <laughs> Pick up the phone and learn, ask questions, right? Have a list of questions before you talk to them. You know, find out what the pros and cons. A lot of the financial advisors that they have now, out of Fidelity or Schwab. 
right? They, um, they're very helpful. Okay. So um, again, why am I, what's the purpose? You know, why did I decide to do this video is because something really different is going on right now in the bond market. We don't know, of course, we don't have a crystal ball and we don't know where yields are going to top out, but this could be, this, this is one of the good things, especially like if you were looking for, you know, if, if you're retired and you were looking for yield um, and you couldn't get it before, well, now you can actually put your money in some bonds um, that are essentially risk-free and and get money, um, you know, and be able to kind of earn some money. So, you know, we haven't had a lot of like really like in terms of being an investor in the stock market, right? There hasn't been a lot of uh, positives over the <laughs> over the last month. I mean, this is something where you can where it's actually pretty good as long as you've got the right time frame and you've got the, the right expectations. All right, guys, thanks for watching the video. I appreciate it. Last thing, you know, I would say, again, we've got three more days of September in terms of seasonality. Let's see how it plays out. Um, also, we've got a big inflation report that's coming out on Friday morning at 8.30. Uh, guys, have a great night. See you tomorrow.